Hello everyone, welcome to the 61st episode in our AI and You podcast series. Today is Friday, May 28, 2021, and I'm your host, Vikar Saidi. I'm a computer scientist and engineer, a lecturer and a consultant. I'm also the author of several books. My most recent book is about artificial intelligence and is titled The Genome Affair. The Genome Affair is a speculative work. It examines what the world might be like if some of the more extraordinary capabilities forecast to be realized in AI over the next 20 to 30 years were actually realized today. Given the growing list of frightening existential threats humankind now faces, the book pays particular attention to the impact AI is expected to have on world affairs. The book is available in ebook format for those who prefer to read on a digital device, but it's also available in a high quality paperback edition. The Genome Affair is available on Amazon, so I hope you'll take the time to read it and to leave a review. Amazon book reviews are very helpful for writers. I'm very interested in how science and technology influence world affairs and the big questions facing humankind. Studying at the confluence of the great disciplines of human history, political science and thought, international affairs, science and technology offers a deep understanding and pedagogically important lessons of how advances in human endeavor have influenced and impacted civilization. I'm available to give talks on artificial intelligence and its related technologies and on the impact AI is expected to have or is already having on our world. If you'd like to get in touch with me to arrange a web-based event or consulting meeting with your company or organization, you can find my contact info in the podcast notes below. Please make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and share it with others if you find the content valuable. Thank you. And now, on to today's podcast. In our last podcast, episode 60, I spoke about the recent dark side cyber attack that struck the oil company Colonial Pipeline and created chaos in the northeast of the United States. In today's podcast, episode 61, I'll talk about the COVID-19 pandemic and analyze what we've learned so far. I'll also discuss implications for the development of artificial intelligence agents that can help us contain such infectious disease outbreaks. Let's get started. The sudden and unexpected outbreak of COVID-19 in January 2020 left the international medical and scientific community reeling. By February, the virus had begun to spread across borders at an alarming rate and most global health systems in the developing world were were ill-equipped to contain such an outbreak of infectious disease if it breached their borders. Medical staff and healthcare infrastructure were simply incapable of treating large numbers of symptomatic patients, many who would require hospitalization, advanced respiratory and life support, and other acute care while at the same time, the number of beds and physicians relative to a rapidly escalating need would be mismatched by orders of magnitude. Pandemic response protocols and health systems in highly advanced countries, including the United States, appeared to be theoretically well prepared. But once the pandemic penetrated their borders, The defects in even these well-staffed and well-funded health systems were laid bare as emergency rooms found themselves overwhelmed and struggling to cope with the escalating volume of sick and dying patients. 
But even during the darkest and most desperate months of the pandemic, there have been some important opportunities to learn from the best practices on display in some parts of the world, particularly with regards to testing, tracing, quarantining, and vaccinating. These best practices will be studied methodically once the pandemic has been relegated to the historical record, and wisdom dictates that we plan better for the next such outbreak. Ironically, those countries that have done remarkably well containing and managing the COVID-19 outbreak have used the latest and best practices in public health and the containment of infectious disease developed in the U.S. and they have also used fourth industrial revolution technologies including artificial intelligence enabled facial recognition to track infections and trace potential transmissions. But the behavior of the society and the structure of government also played a crucial role in the health outcomes and mortality rates of any given society during this pandemic. Regarding behavior, the psychologist Michelle Gelfand at the University of Maryland speaks of tight and loose cultures. For example, in East Asia, the culture of the society is tight, and so they are much more willing to suspend individual freedoms and liberties once they understand that certain, best pr that certain practices are in the best interest of the wider society and will benefit the country as a whole. On the other hand, loose cultures are much less willing to suspend their personal freedoms and liberties for the greater good and are generally suspicious of government agencies advising such practices. In general then, democracies in East Asia, including Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, and Vietnam are characterized by societies with tight cultures, whereas America and Western European societies are best characterized by their loose culture. These Western societies are generally unwilling to acquiesce and surrender personal liber liberties and freedoms in the interest of the public good. This characteristic is most commonly visible in debates surrounding America's Second Amendment in the Bill of Rights, the amendment that guarantees the right to bear arms. This ongoing debate around gun ownership, particularly as it relates to the ownership of military-grade assault weapons, has led to deep fractures and polarization in American society as thousands of citizens perish annually as a consequence of gun violence. Thus, it's not surprising that each of the aforementioned East Asian democracies did very well overall in containing the COVID-19 outbreak, while those in America and Western Europe did not. But it's also interesting to note that it was the loose culture in the societies of America and Western Europe, those who are deeply suspicious of any government proposal to surrender personal liberties, which successfully developed five new vaccines in just nine months following the genomic sequencing of the coronavirus. In summary then, Galfan's loose versus tight culture observation is a complex and nuanced issue. We observe that there are times when loose culture has an advantage over tight culture, and other times when the reverse is true. With regards to governance, we have observed that democracies with centralized systems of government were able to respond to the pandemic quickly and effectively whereas those democracies that are decentralized found it very difficult. For example, 
In the United States, there are approximately 9,000 public health agencies at the federal, state, and local level. Trying to coordinate these distinct entities in a uniform response is all but impossible. In the case of a public health emergency, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, a decentralized system of governance can be catastrophic and lead to untold numbers of unnecessary deaths. And this is precisely what we have experienced in the United States. There is no way to rapidly aggregate data from across the country and so many disparate systems, analyze it, and respond quickly and methodically. Artificial intelligence agents typically analyze large volumes of health data before they are capable of offering effective and optimal strategies for the containment of infectious disease. But with 9,000 disconnected agencies across the United States, such AI-enabled analysis has proven impossible. On the other hand, a decentralized system of government, such as the one in America, a system in which it is, by design, very difficult to govern, a system that has performed quite poorly during the pandemic, a system with separation of powers between federal, state, county, city, town, and village, also makes for a very robust system that is virtually impossible to hijack in a coup d'etat. Thus, once again, there are advantages and disadvantages to our decentralized system. But as we have experienced in America during the pandemic, the disparate and decentralized nature of our health systems and the lack of a national health service with immediate access to centralized data make it nearly impossible to respond rapidly and effectively due to the inability to administer best-in-class public health protocols nationally. In China, the centralization of all functions of government, including public health, ensure that data for the entire society is available immediately and comprehensively. This is expected to be a tremendous advantage for the Chinese, as they develop artificial intelligence agents capable of analyzing data held in the electronic medical rep records of 1.4 billion Chinese citizens and garner health and pathology insights that American medical and scientific research teams are unable to are unable to due to the lack of centralized data. Artificial intelligence scientists at the University of Exeter in the UK have recently developed an AI agent that resides on a smartphone and can determine with 98% accuracy whether a patient has COVID simply by analyzing their cough. It is the analysis of data from a large volume of patients that enables the proficiency of this AI agent. In the United States then, a key lesson we must learn from this pandemic is that there is a high cost to certain aspects of our decentralized system of government. In an age of globalization and increasingly frequent and probable pandemics, health systems will need to be centralized if we are to be capable of rapid and effective response. Furthermore, if we are to be able to compete with the Chinese in the artificial intelligence-based analysis of large volumes of patient data in an effort to gain greater understanding of potential pathologies and the earliest and most efficacious treatments, decentralized health systems will leave our nation in a very vulnerable position. Thank you for spending some time with me. I'm trying to follow the TED Talk format, 
and so I'm keeping these podcasts under 20 minutes. Let me know what you think. I hope you'll find these insights into artificial intelligence helpful, and I hope you'll read my new book, The Genome Affair. It's on Amazon. Until next time, then, this has been the AI and You podcast with author Vikar Saidi.